Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of Alt Legal Connect. Um, I know that you have been here um, and I've been hanging out with you, but I haven't actually gotten to formally greet you. Um, so welcome back. Um, this session is Trade Dress for Success, Strategies for Securing Trade, Dr trade Dress Protection. Um, and this session is sponsored by Two Weeks to Trademarks. So my name is Brie Van Til. I am the Director of Education at Alt Legal. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm also your Master of Ceremonies for Alt Legal Connect. Um, so I'm here to make sure you have an amazing time. Let me know how, how I can help you have a wonderful time. Um, so do need to remind you, of course, because we're not playing. Don't be a jerk. Nobody's been a jerk. You all are just lovely and wonderful people, but don't be a jerk because I don't want to have to ask you to leave. All right. Um, so please note that this session is um, for CLE credit through the state of California. However, it is for live attendance only. Uh, I need you present the entire time, uh, which is about 70 minutes. Um, please do take note of the CLE code when I provide it. Get something to write it down on. Uh, don't trust yourself to remember it. Um, you'll put that code in the survey that you will probably see at the at the chat at the end. Occasionally we forget them, but they are all in the uh, the recap emails for the evening. So you'll fill out that survey, put in the code there, and then you will get a certificate of attendance in your email box immediately, um, as long as your code is correct. All right. Um, legal. Still like a legal technology company. We're not a law firm. We're not giving you legal advice. Um, these views are Jamie's views. They're great views. I'm sure they're not necessarily all legal's views because um, you know, she, she doesn't work for us. All right. Um, as always, use the chat. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, but if you have any questions for Jamie, um, please put them in the chat. Um, but start them with the word question so that it's easier for our, us to spot those. Uh, somebody will, from our team will get them over to her. So I'm pleased to welcome our speaker, Jamie Sternberg. Um, Jamie is counsel at Saunders and Silverstein, um, where she helps clients protect trademarks, copyrights, and domain names. She was recently named one of the World IP Forum's 250 Most Powerful Women in IP, and she's the co-author of Women in Law, Discovering the True Meaning of Success. Here's Jamie. Hi, everyone. And let's, okay, got my slides going. I hope you can all see them. And I'm very happy to be here. I've been practicing as a trademark and copyright attorney for more than 17 years. Um, I joined this law firm, Saunders and Silverstein, that I'm at um, a few years ago in 2019, working fully remote before it was cool to work fully remote. Um, and it's been a pleasure uh, working for a smaller law firm um, and bringing my expertise here, growing the firm and um, dealing with a lot of complex trade dress issues for our clients. And so today we're uh, going to be talking about the types of trade dress available to be registered and enforced, um, inherent distinctiveness, uh, uh, acquired distinctiveness and functionality as they relate to trade dress strategies for successfully registering trade dress with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, as well as enforcement of trade dress. And we'll talk about some current cases like the Adidas case, the um, case Nike just filed against BAPE or BAPE. I'm, I forgot to look that up before this presentation. I'm not sure how to say it. I, I know how to read it. Um, and as well as another uh, trade dress case involving some cookies out of Utah. Okay, so to begin um, the basics, trade dress is distinctional, distinctive non-functional designs or um, verbal devices identifying a source. Um, they have to be distinctive and they have to be non-functional. So generally um, it's product packaging uh, labels, tags, um, envelopes, um, and it's the overall impression of all of those things. 
including graphics, um, wording that there may be on there, stylization of wording, and things like that. So the overall impression, color combinations, and the other main type of trade dress is product design, which is the size, shape, configuration, et cetera, color of a product. So um, as an example, um, this is a Yankee candle. This would be um, packaging, the label. This would be the design of the bottle, would be product design, the configuration. So there's an example for you. It's sitting on my desk. Um, so what's not trade dress? Items that are merely ornamental. So something that is across uh, a shirt, a big design or lettering. Uh, usually size is taken into account on ornamental features that people try to um, get a trade dress registration for. Um, anything that's functional, so that's essential to the use or purpose of the product, or that affects the cost or quality, it's not registrable as trade dress, or a generic design that's so common it can't um, identify a particular source. So an example of that would be the design of a cup. This probably isn't registrable, registrable as trade dress because it's such a generic design. So when you think about enforcing or protecting trade dress, whether it's through common law or registration, um, you need to keep this flow chart in mind. So you have your design that you want to seek protection for. It has to be non-functional and it has to be distinctive, either inherently or um, by acquired distinctiveness. So non-functional, try to determine if it's product design and product packaging. Sometimes the characterization is not clear, which we will be talking about during this presentation. Um, if it's product design, you need to demonstrate acquired distinctiveness or secondary meaning. They mean the same thing. If it's product packaging, it could potentially be inherently distinctive. And so no further um, evidence of distinctiveness is necessary. Or you may have to demonstrate that it's acquired distinctiveness or um, has secondary meaning. And we'll talk about what what those uh, distinctiveness terms mean um, as we go through this presentation. So examples of product packaging. This um, label is a classic example of well, a label. Labels fall under product packaging. This fans label um, on the top left uh, can appear on the side seam of a, a shirt or on, um, on a shoe. The um, the box with the thank you on it, um, the you know the product packaging, the Fiji label, um, the entire you know the overall the whole overall impression of that with the stylized wording and the and the leaves on there and the flower, the shape of the bottle to the left of the Fiji bottle. Uh, I'm sorry, not the shape. The shape is actually excluded because it would be a, probably deemed a generic design. So what's included is this um, red uh, red overlay there as the product packaging. And underneath that, the Jameson bottle also is dotted out as not being excluded as part of the registration because, again, that's probably considered a generic bottle design. And so the colors used on the packaging, the stylization, the overall look and feel um, and then again, the way that this um, uh, nail polish bottle appears, and these are all registrations for pack product packaging. Um, the Red Bull packaging, um, the way that the can looks with the color scheme and the stylization of the wording. And the same thing here on the um, Orangina bottle. Or is it Orangina? We, we can talk about that later during the question time. Uh, so, and then examples of product design are some things that maybe you wouldn't think of. So classically, the shape of the Coke bottle is there. That's what everyone thinks of when they think of product design. That's the first thing I think of. But it can also be applied to things like um, the designs on sneakers, which, you know, you might maybe someone would consider that product packaging. Could be product design. 
generally it's considered product design. Um, so the um, the checker the checkerboard on the side of a van shoe, everything else is dotted out, including that um, swoosh logo on there because they have separate protection for that. And so it's just the checkerboard being claimed as part of the product design. The bottom of this um, shoe on the upper right is the only thing claimed in that registration. So just the, the aesthetic design of that part of the shoe product. This seashell type design on the Nike shoe underneath that is what's claimed in that. Um, I, think, I think that's actually an application. And actually the Vans uh, shoe is, is still, pen uh, no, no, that's registered. That one's registered. Um, and then the, the specific aesthetic design of, that's non-functional of this, um, these glasses on the bottom, the, the specific aesthetic design that's um, clearly, I guess, not functional for, for Apple's AirPods, right? Um, but they've, again, dotted out the functional part of the piece that goes in your ear. And this makeup um, brush in the middle. Some other um, examples of, of um, product designs and product packaging. And again, things can cross the line, like this design of this these two perfume bottles. Um, is that product design or product packaging? You could make arguments either way. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And obviously this carry gold, the box is dotted out. So that's, you know, product packaging. Um, and this Yeti is the, what's claimed as the configuration of the cooler for Yeti, so product design. And as we've been talking about, characterization is not always clear, and there's um, some well-known cases on these topics. Um, first one being uh, two pesos versus Taco Cabana, which you may have seen in your law school textbooks. And in this case, uh, Taco Cabana owned, um, was a chain of Mexican restaurants in Texas. And another company opened a um, similarly looking Mexican restaurants in Texas. And uh, Taco Cabana sued for infringement based on common law trademark rights that they had in what they considered to be the trade dress of their restaurants, which I've written in the slide as being um, a festive eating environment, having an interior dining and patio areas decorated with artifacts, bright colors, paintings and murals, and a festive vivid color scheme using a top border paint and neon stripes, bright awnings and umbrellas on the exterior. And the Supreme Court determined that that was akin to product packaging and hence it could be protected under Section 43A, as a common law trademark, that's inherently distinctive. And it, they didn't have to show um, secondary meaning as you would with product design. And they classified it as either, it's either product packaging or something akin to product packaging or using the Latin term tertium quid, a third thing that is indefinite and undefined. So sometimes what you are trying to protect as trade dress will be that tertium quid. And that can be explained further as if you look at a Coke bottle, some may see that as a classic product design registration. If you just pick it up, drink it and throw it away, you just see it as a product, um, I'm sorry, product packaging, product packaging, that's how you recognize it. Whereas someone who may be a bottle collector and is really interested in the specific design of the product may see it as trade dress relating to product design. Um, so it can be both or either. And your job when you're trying to get um, trade dress uh, protected is to argue for product packaging so you don't have to demonstrate um, acquired distinctiveness. However, if things are not clear, then um, the default, and I'll go back to this one, the default will be um, product design so that the trademark owner is um, 
has to prove acquired distinctiveness just in case, basically. And they talk about that in Walmart, the uh, Samara Brothers, which again, you may have seen in law school textbooks. And in this case, um, Walmart commissioned a designer to create this kid's clothing similar to the Samara Brothers clothing, which um, Samara Brothers described as um, a one-piece seersucker with appliques of hearts, flowers, fruits, and the like. When they, um, that's how they described it when they sued Walmart for um, infringement. And the Supreme Court determined that unlike two pesos, the designs on clothing were closer to product um, design rather than product packaging. And so in that case, if you're trying to get designs on clothing registered, you will most likely have to demonstrate acquired distinctiveness because and another reason is the examining attorney may find that it's ornamental and you may have to make that showing anyway. And just another example of, of two different, of the layouts of stores being um, analyzed in two different ways. The dry bar registration was found to be, the dry bar or trade dress in, this, in the registration was found to be inherently distinctive. Whereas the Apple store layout that you see on the bottom was determined to need acquired distinctiveness. Because in that case, the examining attorney um, thought that the design that they were trying to get registered looked more like um, what a normal like uh, store would look like in a mall. And so it, Apple had to demonstrate that customers, when they see an Apple store, know without looking at the sign or anything else that that's an Apple store and not just any other mall kind of retail space. Whereas in the dry bar case, there was enough elements in there um, to demonstrate that this wasn't a typical, this wasn't a typical way that a salon looked. It had color, that had stylization, didn't just look like your typical mall store. And so the examining attorneys made two separate determinations in this case, one that the dry bar was inherently distinctive, one that the Apple store needed a showing of acquired distinctiveness. Um, and then this is a case specifically from my practice where we had to go through all the different um, hurdles to try to get this, um, this mark registered. And the mark um, is quite small, but we showed it in the drawing on in the application as um, it's a tab that's on the side seam of an apparel top and it bears checkerboard. Um, and so all these, so this is the drawing is on the right and then the specimen of use or the images on the left and just a close up image of the specimen. So in this case, um, the we got a refusal that the, uh, the tab was a merely ornamental feature of the goods, and so it didn't function as a trademark. And the examining attorney wanted us to curiously amend the goods that we had listed as, you know, clothing tops to um, clothing labels sold as a component of clothing tops. And we obviously, the client wasn't selling labels, they were selling clothing. So that wasn't correct in our view. And because the examining attorney wanted that amendment, um, he viewed the mark as product design, as a label, where our view was that it was classic product packaging because it was a label. Um, and so our, the first round of responses, we talked about how it was inherently distinctive product packaging which is generally what you want to do on the first round. If you can, if you have viable arguments that it's inherently distinctive, that's probably how you want the strategy that you want to follow because you, it's, it's more favorable to have on the record that your trademark is inherently distinctive um, rather than um, you know having to demonstrate acquired distinctiveness, which in some cases is fine, or having to amend the application to the supplemental register. 
Um, and then the USPTO's position on response to that was still, it was that a clothing label, curiously, um, that um, required a demonstration of acquired distinctiveness. So uh, we argued again, that's not a clothing label, um, made some additional arguments, and then argued in the alternative that if it did indeed need a showing of acquired distinctiveness, it had acquired distinctiveness based on five or more years of use. Um, and the USPTO deemed that insufficient. We needed to have more evidence of acquired distinctiveness. So we responded again with it, um, with actually when we said that we made the first acquired distinctiveness claim, we also amended the drawing to put a dotted line where the label and the shirt met to try to help our argument that we really were just claiming the placement of a label that um, had checkerboard on it as the trademark. Um, and so we had to appeal to the TTAB because we had run out of chances with the USPTO and we requested remand with additional evidence of acquired distinctiveness, which the examining attorney promptly rejected saying um, that uh, it wasn't sufficient evidence. And um, in his view, we don't, we don't agree that that wasn't the case, but that was the USPTO's view. Um, and uh, so it went back, it went back to the TTAB because we were, we had our, we had already initiated the appeal and uh, we asked for it to be remanded to the examining attorney again, to go onto the supplemental register, which was accepted by the examining attorney. And the amendment to the mark drawing did help us get through that issue with the examining attorney regarding like the tops versus label issue. So you can see from this prosecution history here that it can be, people can have different views on how to um, characterize trade dress. And there's a lot of different strategies that you can take um, to try to get it registered. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we basically had everything thrown at us during this, the prosecution of this application. So it was a very interesting um, learning experience. And it's, um, and it's, you know, we amended it to the supplemental register. Um, so this is a duplicate. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, if you, if you can argue that your trade dress is inherently distinctive, as we tried to do, um, initially with the, um, with the label example that I just gave, um, the factors that the USPTO or courts are going to look at are the Seabrook, uh, factors. And it's, um, they're going to look at whether the trade dress, um, if it, if it meets any of these factors, you can't claim that it's inherently distinctive. So, um, if they're going to look at whether it's a common shape or design, if it's unique or unusual in a particular field, um, if it's a mere refinement of a common or well-known form of ornamentation um, for that particular you know, class of goods or industry, or um, whether it's capable of making a commercial impression distinct from any accompanying words. Um, oh, okay. I just looked at the comments. Bape is otherwise known as the bathing ape. Has been using, okay, okay. It's been using the similar Air Force One product design and their bape test of footwear for a decade already. Um, why is Nike just now enforcing their rights? Okay, so we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that later when we get to, we talk about the case and um, and we will talk about um the, dip, the bottoms of shoes. We will talk about um, uh, the Christian Louboutin case uh, later on in the, uh, the slideshow. So we will get to both of those things. All right. So I can't flip to the next slide. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so the trade dress for this scope bottle was deemed to be inherently distinctive. Although when I was preparing for this um, presentation, um, I was already familiar with this case. And it's interesting that 
they do talk about it. That it it has to be product packaging to be inherently distinctive, right? Really, in this case, it is, you know, it's product. I would see this as product design that would need acquired distinctiveness. However, um, they, they discuss the Seabrook factors in here, and um, and it was found that it that it was inherently distinctive. So they went through the Seabrook factors. Um, they found that the cap of the uh, this mouthwash bottle was not a common geometric shape. It wasn't commonly used in the mouthwash industry. This the cap and the shape of the bottle are unique. Um, in fact, it won an award because it was a radical, um, you know, diversion from how generic bottles looked in the mouthwash industry. Um, and the examining attorney failed to make of record any other examples of mouthwash bottles with this design. In fact, um, uh, Procter & Gamble had picked this design specifically so that people would want to keep um, the mouthwash on their, on their sink so they, would, they wouldn't forget about it under the sink and that they would use it. Um, and then in this case, for the packaging of pancake mix, uh, the district court in Utah found that even though different elements of the product design had been used other places or may have been generic, the combination of these designs together, creating the whole color scheme and layout and things like that, um, was not commonly used in the pancake market. And so this trade dress was deemed to be inherently distinctive under the Seabrook factors. In the Lululemon case, there um, the Lululemon was trying to register the um, piping on the front of um, an apparel top. And the TTAB determined that um, that the, the size and shape and dominance of the elements um, demonstrated that it was ornamental. Um, it wasn't inherently distinctive. And, um, and the USPTO presented sufficient evidence that designs covering a large area on clothing generally get registered on the supplemental register. They're not inherently distinctive. Another case of um, a potentially ornamental design that was actually found to be inherently distinctive was were these uh, this lightning bolt design on the side of a tire. It wasn't something that tire manufacturers usually did. Um, this this type of design wasn't common in the industry. And you can compare that to the general tire and rubber case where the trademark owner sought to register or protect uh, white concentric circles, rings around the outer surf sidewall of a tire. And that was deemed to be ornamental because it was commonly used in the um, uh, putting these white rings around tires was a common thing to do in the industry. All right, so if you if you have to go about showing acquired distinctiveness, um, you're basically demonstrating that even though your trademark may be a sort of descriptive element or an ornamental element, uh, consumers still recognize it as emanating with just one source of that good. Um, so it always applies to product design and it may apply to product packaging. You can start with trying to argue that the mark has um, been in use for five years prior to when you make the claim of distinctiveness. And like, um, uh, for example, like uh, if you know that your product is product design or it's a color which requires a claim of um, acquired distinctiveness, you may wanna consider making that five-year claim in the application when you file the application, and maybe that'll be sufficient for the USPTO. They may come back to you and say, we need more evidence of acquired distinctiveness, but if you're pretty sure that's gonna be an issue, you may just wanna go ahead and check that box for five years in the application. Um, if you need additional evidence, I would wait to submit that on 
during examination. Um, you may need it if you are uh, filing an infringement action um, for common law use. And so different ways to show this, the length of time, it may be more than five years, it may be 20 years, it may be more. The exclusivity of use during that time attempts to copy um, the trade dress, a consumer survey, advertisements, advertising expenditures, frequency of advertising, where you advertise, any unsolicited media coverage, sales units sold, you know, sales revenue, um, social media statistics, web analytics, things like that. All of that um, helps to demonstrate acquired distinctiveness. Um, all right, I, I'm just taking a quick look at the questions, which I will get to at the end. Um, all right. So as I just briefly mentioned, um, color marks in order to protect a single color in connection that's using connection with a product, you have to demonstrate acquired distinctiveness. And as with any other trade dress, you also have to show that it's not functional. And um, these concepts are, were discussed in um, like the Qualitex, uh, the Qualitex case, for example, um, which again, you may have read in, in law school. Um, but the Tiffany color blue on a, shown on the, on the drawing here on a box, um, pink on uh, in, insulation, is the classic example. The bottom of um, a red sole shoe by Christian Louboutin that contrasts what it has to contrast with an up, uh, upper of a different color. And this application, which I uh, filed just a year ago, um, which hasn't been examined yet, uh, for the color orange on what's called a direct tension indicating washer. And so I, I do want to say that in this application for the color orange, we did click the box for five years of acquired distinctiveness, five years of use for the acquired distinctiveness claim. So I did do that at the outset. Um, and then in some cases, um, in this Forney case by the Federal Circuit decided recently, they said that... Um, this this uh, combination of colors could be deemed to be inherently distinctive because again it wasn't a single color mark that they were trying to register and the court saw it as um, more like a logo or design or like some kind of symbol that's a combination of colors arranged in a particular design rather than trying to register one single color um, and so they said that it it was capable of getting registered uh, was capable of being inherently distinctive, right? But the on remand, the examining attorney um, still held that it failed to function as, as a trademark, um, that it didn't pass the Seabrook test, it wasn't an inherently distinctive mark, um, and that it was ornamental, and that, that the applicant could either amend the application to the supplemental register, register or make a claim of acquired distinctiveness. Um, okay, so moving past distinctiveness, now talking about um, functionality. So um, the trademark um, that you, the trade dress that you want to register um, has to be non-functional. So it can't be essential to the use or purpose of the product or the cost or quality of it. Um, and those are from cases that you may have heard of, Traffics, um, Qualitex, and, and Wood Labs. Um, so there's two sorts of functionality that, that are going to be at issue. Util utilitarian functionality, um, which means that really it's essential to like the use of the product. So if it's related to a utility patent or um, you're touting, the trademark owner is touting the utilitarian advantages of that particular trade dress, like, you know, like the specific color functions to do something in particular. There is no alternative designs. Um, so you can't keep your competitors uh, from using your trade dress because there's no other design they could use. Um, and whether, and, and if it's the cheapest way to do it or the, a, a more, a, a more, a cheaper, a cheaper way to do it, um, then you can't exclude someone from using that trade dress. 
And then aesthetic functionality, you will think of more of like um, a color um, affecting the specific purpose or use or um, making it, you know, uh, your competitor would have trouble competing, makes it particularly desirable. And so you'd have a competitive advantage. So an example of that is using black on the motorboat. Um, and that was deemed aesthetically functional. Um, and then another classic example was that um, Louboutin's uh, red sole shoe, as it contrasts with a different colored upper, was not deemed to be aesthetically functional. Um, and they weren't able to enforce the uh, that trademark against uh, YSL because arguably using a red sole with a red upper um, should be permitted. It should be permitted by competitors to have an all, you know, shoes of all of one color, which is the line of shoes that Yves Saint Laurent had. Um, whereas the design of, uh, you, of these utensils was found to be aesthetically functional and that competitors needed to be able to use this design, I'm not really sure why they couldn't design their silverware in a different way. Um, I didn't read this case, but it seemed a little funny to me that um, the, the design was found to be sort of more desirable over any other design that you could find for utensils. Maybe a good dis discussion point. Um, so the way that a functionality refusal plays out is that. Um, that the USPTO needs to make a prima facie case with some, some evidentiary support that the, the trade dress is functional. There is no set amount of support that they need to present, but they just need to make a prima facie case and have some evidence. And then the, and, and of course they can ask you questions right in the office action to try to bolster their case um, about like, you know, how often is this used in your industry and, you know, like, is it necessary for, uh, you know, do your competitors use it? Um, does it make your product more competitive? Um, you know, they can ask you those questions and then make your case, right? Um, so once they do raise the issue of functionality, then the burden shifts the applicant to present evidence uh, rebutting that um, prima facie case. Um, so uh, if there is evidence of a utility patent, that will demonstrate that, you know, a feature might be functional. And in that case, an applicant will bear a heavy burden of showing that the feature is not functional if it's the subject of a utility patent. However, if it's the subject of a design patent, that actually goes in the applicant's favor because if it's, if it's protected as, as a design patent, it is inherently not functional. So that helps a, uh, a case of trade dress uh, registration. Um, and when you're filing an application for trade dress, generally um, you're only permitted to have one trademark in any trademark application. Um, and But sometimes you need two different views, right, of, um, of the mark drawing that you're trying to register. And so you can petition to the director to show multiple views. And in this case, on the side, that was granted. They're trying to get um, the ring shape around the top of the shoe registered. Everything else is dotted out. Um, so in terms of filing your application, you know, artists who help prepare patent application drawings are a good resource uh, for helping you with your trade dress drawing. Um, you really want to be careful where you include the dotted lines around what's not claimed as part of the trade dress. So making sure you're only including what is inherently distinctive or what you can claim um, has acquired distinctiveness. So any around anything functional, generic, wording that you may already have um, protection for, things like that. And then you want to do a clear mark description and color claim because that's going to help with examination. Um, and I talked about making that claim of five years at the outset if you know if you think that's going to be an issue. 
And then just prepare your client for a potential distinctiveness a refusal or functionality refusal. Um, it's not, you're not always going to get a functionality refusal. It, um, that may not be an issue, right? Um, you may not, your mark may be inherently distinctive. They, that may not be an issue, but it's a good idea to like um, talk to the, talk to your client about that, um, get a budget going and maybe start collecting the evidence that you're going to need to demonstrate that it's not functional and that it's distinctive. Um, so we sort of went through this already in terms of like an ornamental refusal um, when we talked about the side seam label. Um, first, you want to try to argue inherent distinctiveness if that's a viable claim. If you can't or that doesn't work, you can start with a claim of um, acquired distinctiveness based on five or more years of use. And then you can submit evidence of acquired distinctiveness. Generally, that's submitted. The evidence is attached to a declaration um, from a, you know, an authorized, who's ever authorized to attest to the evidence from the trademark owner, you know, maybe the in-house counsel or someone from the marketing department. Um, and in that declaration, you're going to have like uh, sales numbers, you know, like advertising expenditures, years of use things like that. And then you're going to like attach the, um, any documentary evidence to that. And then um, you may have to amend the mark drawing to remove functional elements to help get it through if necessary. And then if all else fails or the client doesn't have the budget or the time to make a claim of acquired distinctiveness, you could consider registering it on the supplemental register if that is an option. It may not be an option. Um, and then enforcement of trade dress rights. All right. So, uh, I just want to see where we are here. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, so obviously it's better to have registered rights, um, but you can enforce you can't enforce trade dress based on common law and on un and unregistered rights. So if you see that someone's infringing your trade dress, you know, you can always make that that claim um, that your that your trade dress is, is distinctive or has acquired distinctiveness. Um, it is it is easier to do it based on registered rights because a presumption that your trade dress is able to be in uh, protected and that it's 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 uh, enforceable trade dress is already given to you and with that registration. I mean the the other side could always um, argue against that, of course, um, that maybe the USPTO made the wrong decision. Um, so that's always a possibility. But if you're sending out demand letters, having that registration obviously puts you in a stronger position. It makes enforcement of the trademark less expensive because some of the presumption the presumptions are already there. Um, and so people may decide to back down um, rather than fight. Um, and it's the same thing. You have to demonstrate that the trade dress is distinctive and also potentially not functional um, because the other side could defend um, based on those points. Um, saying that you don't have protectable trade dress, maybe it's functional, maybe you haven't made a sufficient showing of distinctiveness. You should still uh, monitor for infringement based on trade dress. If you can, as much as you can, as monitoring can be more difficult for that. And if you see something that could potentially be infringement, be diligent about sending demand letters. Because if you don't have a registration and you're just trying to enforce common law trade dress, um, if you have an enforcement program, that will be a good, some good ammunition in your pocket without that registration. And some people decide that they want, that's what their, the strategy they want, right? Maybe they don't think it's registrable, but they still want to sort of protect it. Um, and they don't want like a negative decision on the public record that it's not actually trade dress or it's on, they don't want a supplemental registration, you know? So some that's a strategy that you can definitely um, use depending on what the trade dress is. So 
now getting into um, these uh, particular case, trade dress cases, and then we will go to questions. So the Nike case um, was just filed at the end of January. And in this case, Nike had plenty of registrations to rely on for its um, Air Force One and Air Jordan One shoe designs that it claims were being infringed. So in the left column, you can see the drawing of that's the mark drawing in the registrations. Um, next to the actual specimen of the Nike shoes, and then in the right column, the um, allegedly infringing shoes. Um, so, so obviously Nike had its registered rights, has its registered rights to rely on, which is makes it a lot easier, right? Um, they're very, as you can see, diligent about getting protection for the design of their shoe products. But they also submitted um, in their complaint some allegations regarding um, acquired distinctiveness and fame. And so they put in some extra, they put in allegations in there, even though they had these registrations. And that's still a good idea to demonstrate that um, because, and just anticipate arguments that the other side might have, right? Um, in this case, it was easy for them because they, they argued like millions and billions of dollars of sales and consumer recognition and, um, and things like that. So if you have that and it's and you're you're able to prove that, then you know that it may be a good idea. And in this case, Nike also alleged a claim of dilution, so they needed to um, allege some facts regarding fame. Um, in this uh, crumble cookies be dirty dough case out of Utah, um, a former employee of Crumble Cookies. Um, started the dirty this dirty dough business, and Crumble filed suit uh, last year in May in Utah, claiming that Dirty Dough stole their logos, their graphics, um, the designs of the cookies that they sell, and their packaging, as well as some recipes um, and the complaint. And these were all there was. They had some registered rights, which we'll talk about, but most of their trade dress claims were based on common law trade dress rights. Um, and Dirty Dough, um, this is just sort of an aside, but they used, they used the suit to, um, in social media and they were kind of like tongue in cheek about it and, you know, saying like, we don't sue people. We just make better cookies. Um, you know, we, I'm having trouble seeing all these signs that I put in the slide here because my video is over them. Um, but they were making light about, um, about the, the lawsuit. And so I don't know, that's their strategy. And, um, but if they're found to be infringing, you know, um, it's, it could potentially, um, and, you know, the, and these, and this uh, marketing campaign added to their profits that are maybe allegedly infringing, um, you know, that could be a potential issue for them. Let's see. So they relied on um, registered rights for this um, crumble cookie logo, as well as the box design of their cookie packaging box, and then the, the word mark crumble. So um, you can see an example of how uh, trade dress packaging is described um, in a registration. Um, it's it can be very detailed, as you can see from the slide claiming the color pink, um, you know, the, the packaging is dotted out because they're just, um, they're just claiming the designs and the color. Oh, it sounds like I came in perfectly. All right. Okay. Um, our code, make sure to write it down, please. The code is the number six, the word bottle. The number two, I apologize. It looks like my camera's kind of having some trouble focusing on that. That is six, bottle two, as in the Coke bottle, as in all sorts of distinctive trade dress bottles. All right, <laughs> carry on, Jamie. Okay. Um, all right. 
I just want to see. I'm just reading through this for one second. Okay. All right. So then the designs of the cookies that they were claiming infringed are basically all based on common law, right? Um, so the crumble cookies are on the right part of the slide and the dirty dozen cookies are on the left part of the slide. Um, and crumble was claiming that overall, um, I'm sorry, that's not true. Um, the dirty dozen, so I was showing them in two sets. So we're looking at the top of the slide. So that's the two cookies compared at the top of the slide then the two sort of cinnamon roll looking cookies. Um, on the left side and then on the right side, the two com the comparison of the two cookies. Um, so, I mean, maybe a discussion point that we can have after is, you know, are you convinced by this? I mean, to me, like some of these things look maybe potentially a little generic, like the cinnamon roll looking design. Um, I'm not completely convinced that um, I mean, maybe some of the cookies look similar, but I, I may have baked cookies that look like that too. So um, maybe they have an argument based on genericness um, or a mentality. There is, they don't have acquired distinctiveness. So some really interesting issues in this, in this case. And um, also here, a comparison of the respective um, packaging um, again, you know, different colors being used. Yes, the boxes are shaped the same, but different colors, um, you know, and I, you know, it, there's arguments that they're trying to protect an idea of how to package a cookie and, but the expressions of how to package that cookie are different. Um, so, and we're talking about trade dress here. We're not talking about uh, we're not talking about patents. Um, so, you know, I, I think my personal view is I think that Crumble probably has an uphill battle in this case. Um, but a, a good discussion point for after. Um, and then finally, the Adidas um, v. Tom Brown case, which was just decided uh, last month in Tom Brown's favor. So, uh, you know, classic case of, um, you know, trade dress on apparel that um, Adidas, you know, is obviously famous for the, uh, the three stripe design. They use it on all types of apparel, um, <clears throat> shoes and, and different types of clothing. And Tom Brown was started to use a four stripe design. They had used a three stripe design on clothing um, and had agreed several years before Adidas filed suit to change their mark to make it um, from three to four and had started using four on clothing, but then started expanding to um, athletic apparel, becoming more popular and sort of like maybe um, getting into Adidas's um, commercial space a little bit more. And so even though Tom Brown had been using this uh, four stripe pattern on clothing for um, several years, um, Adidas took the opportunity to file suit. I believe it was 2018. Um, and, oh no, they started, I'm sorry. They start, they reached out to Tom Brown in 2018. They didn't file suit until like 2020 or 2021. Um, but Tom Brown ultimately won claiming, you know, three stripes is different than, than, um, four stripes. A lot of people use stripes on clothing. Um, they waited many years to object to their use of four stripes. Um, uh, and clearly the jury, um, thought that, you know, these arguments were persuasive because they only deliberated for two hours. Um, and so they determined that, oh, and also Tom Brown markets to a completely different sort of um, consumer base. Um, their clothes are a lot more expensive and the jury just found that there wouldn't be consumer confusion. But again, recognizing that Adidas had a three stripe trademark, a three stripe, they had, 
um, clearly enforceable trade uh, dress rights to three stripes on apparel, as did Tom Brown. Um, and so a very interesting um, case regarding uh, trade dress to study that concept. And with that, I am ready to, to talk about, to take questions. And it seems like we have plenty to fill our full 70 minutes here. Okay, so. Okay, so, um, okay, it's pronounced BAPE, thank you. Um, do packages containers need to be unique more than a regular candle container? So, um, well, I just had this candle container, it happened to be on my desk, but um, I mean, in this case, I'm not actually sure that Yankee Candle has a registration for this jar. Um, I just wanted to sort of demonstrate product design, but as you can see, like from that mouthwash bottle, that was pretty unique. It had an award. The Coke bottle was um, obviously innovative in its time. And so it needs, there needs to be, and it's, it, and it's possible that um, some elements of this candle jar, if not all elements are unique, right? It could be the cap, just they could just claim trade dress protection for the cap. Clearly um, this part of the cap with the ridges um, is functional, right? Um, you, you know, part of the functionality of, of this part is to suction to make sure the flame goes out. Um, so it's just, you really want to try to look at the unique pieces of a product design that's not functional and focus on that. And keep it very clear what you're claiming um, protection for. Um, let's see. Uh, why is Nike just enforcing the rights when they could have done it earlier before uh, Bape became a household name in the sneaker culture. I don't know why Nike waited till now. <laughs> I mean, that might be an uphill battle that they're going to have to deal with similar to the Adidas Tom Brown case. Um, so I, I, I don't know why they made that decision. It could, could be that they felt again, like Tom Brown was encroaching onto their, their market share. And that before there wasn't really any overlap or any potential for consumer confusion. And now there is. Um, could this also apply to design on bottom of the shoe? We talked about that. Can you discuss the difference between trade dress and patent design? Can an applicant claim both? Um, I'm not a patent attorney. I, um, I mean, as I talked about, um, they're both non-functional aesthetic features of a product. They, and it both, you can have both at the same time. Um, can you speak to registering trade dress for a website? What would be persuasive in arguing trade dress protection for a website or proving trade dress infringement of a website? Yes, you can You can do that. You can claim trade dress infringement for a website. And again, you want to be precise about exactly what you're claiming. You may have to take out wording. Um, but if there's unique features of a website, then, um, you know, that could potentially be considered um you know, probably product packaging, I would think. Uh, and I have, I um, have, I've had a few cases claiming trade, uh, trade dress infringement for a website or uh, infringement of a website. You can also use copyright protection. Um, that's a, a better way to do it, actually, maybe to get copyright protection for, for the website and do it that way. Um, we've done that before. So that's another alternative. Um, so that's the next question. Does having a copyright have any impact? Uh, I mean, you can have both at the same time. I, I um, don't think that impacts, I don't know. I, I really haven't seen the intersection of having copyright uh, registration in terms of like a distinctiveness or functionality issue. I mean, you can clearly, you can have, you can have both, right? Um, so it may be that the strategy is to have, you may think it may be, and it may, actually maybe it's easier to get a copyright registration if you think you're going to have distinctiveness issues uh, um, for a trade dress claim. 
Um, so that's one um, strategy that you might want to consider. Um, okay. First comment, dirty dough use a uh, new and effective strategy of making a farce of trademark trade dress law by taking possible infringement into the court of public opinion and making the trademark owner out to be a bully. Any data on wins losses in actual legal proceedings versus the court? Of, I don't have data on that. Sorry. Um, I, I, I mean, well, that's, I mean, I can maybe not in a trade dress case, but certainly I think in the case of, oh gosh, can't remember the, the name. There was the name Lady, Lady A and the band, uh, the antebellum band. I think that that clearly helped um, the owner of the, the Lady A um, trademark who was like in Seattle or something like that. I think that helped. Um, there was a case with, oh my gosh, like eight, some kind of Asian buns or something like that out of San Francisco, where I think that was definitely sort of litigated in the court of public opinion. Um, and so the defendant ended up, ended up getting a pretty good settlement or res resolution in that case. So yeah, I think that maybe Dirty Doe felt, you know, that they they didn't have such a great case and, and, and this is their strategy. And that's, and it's and it's totally a reasonable strategy, um, and it's and it's a strategy that clients have talked to me about doing. And if we don't think that there's we don't see a problem with it, then um, you know that maybe you could give your blessing on a potential strategy like that. If you don't feel your your case is good, or you want to try to get some leverage in negotiating uh, a resolution of that case. Um, have you noticed that the PTO is putting less emphasis on declarations submitted by trademark owners, consumers, and vendors of goods? Yeah, I mean, I have, I have, I noticed. I mean, I they have said examining attorneys have said in office actions that well, you only have you only have a declaration by the owner saying this, right? Um, and it's it can be self serving. So if you can get some. If you can get, I think like, I think the issue is more with trademark owners. So if you can get um, a consumer or like um, the distributors of your goods um, to, to put forth a declaration that could potentially be uh, helpful, though, if you have sufficiently strong evidence of acquired distinctiveness, um, I, for the most part, it's okay that the trademark owner signs it. It may be with respect to certain declarations in that affidavit um, that may be better said by a third party. Um, there is some good evidence that advertising works to damage bully brands. Look at the Oatly UK case. There's another example. Um, oh, antebellum. Yes. Okay. We got that. Um, oh, yeah. The Moki muffins. Yes. That was what I was talking about. Um, okay. According to social listening data provided to the drum by Synthesio at the time, August 2021, 39% of the social conversations linked to Oatly followed the judgment or following the judgment were negative. In the three months before the lawsuit, just 13% of the combination conversations were negative. So that shows um, the power of litigating a case in, in the court of public opinion. So a possible strategy can, to consider. And is that it? Are there any more questions? Um, thank you so much, everybody. And I think that there is an after discussion, um, which I will be going to if you want to discuss anything further about um, my presentation. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so we will have the post-session uh, discussion um, will be um, will be in the breakout rooms. Uh, so take a few minutes, um, take a bio break, um, do what you need to do. Um, but we'll see you in about five ish minutes in the post session discussion room to talk about uh, to talk about trade dress and how to effectively register that and other things like that. Um, after that, um, we will have um, we will be back here in the stream tab at 420 
uh, for claim on you, proactive steps you can take to avoid IP malpractice claims, which is for ethics credit. Uh, so definitely make sure to join us for that. Thank you so much, Jamie. We really appreciate that. It was super entertaining um, and educational. And you know, we loved seeing all the pictures and your visual aids and all of that. <laughs> Those are you. so fun. All yeah. right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you in the breakout room. Take care. Bye.